I want you to put your thinking caps on this morning. Remember your thinking caps? Your school teacher always told you to put your thinking cap on and we would always go. Imaginary cap. And um, I want you to think of how, think of examples of how false prophets, false teachers, false churches, false cults, how they replace God's Word with something else. Think of, think of examples of how they do that, because I'm going to ask you about that in uno momento, por favor. I bought me a Spanish Bible the other day at an Amish second-hand store, and uh, it did have 1 John 5, 7 in it, which I was very pleased uh, but I'm not sure of the translation of Daniel 3.25 where it was the Son of God instead of a Son of the Gods. So I'm curious about that. I don't know Spanish. So it's like burrito and quesadilla and stuff like that. I know what bur- Do you know what the word burrito means? A burro is a donkey. A burrito is a little donkey. And they call it that because a donkey can carry a lot of stuff. Okay? So you put all this stuff in a little donkey, a burrito, and roll it up and eat it. That's true. That's all I know. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is... Present tense is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Now, this article just, I just came out this morning. Super blood moon apocalypse again. Bible prophecy predicts end of world just days away. See, that sounds like National Enquirer stuff, okay? Biblical prophecy suggests... Now, let me tell you something about biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy, real Bible prophecy, never suggests anything. It says it, and it happens exactly the way it's said. Not in a roundabout way, not kinda. It happens exactly the way God said Biblical prophecy suggests the end of days is due this month as the earth is set to witness a rare blood moon. Doomsday preachers have claimed. Preachers believe passages from the book of Acts and Revelation suggest the blood moon will accompany uh, an an ever-approaching end of days. Uh, Let's see here. The theory was originally made famous by Christian ministers John Hagee and Mark Biltz. Uh, Mark Biltz is a Hebrew roots nut okay these guys are nuts these are they're off way off base who said the ongoing tetrad of four consecutive lunar eclipses which began in april 2014 with six full moons in between is the indicator of the end of the earth as described in the bible in acts 2 20 revelation 6 12 however the tetrad ended in september 2014 and we're still here okay um You've got John Hagee, Mark Biltz. Um, who else was in here, in on this? Ed Begley? No, not Ed Begley. What was the name? Oh, Pastor Paul Begley. Warns of apocalyptic signs in the heavens. He's an internet, I think he's an internet only, quote unquote, pastor. I do not think he has a real congregation. Uh... But they're all saying that this stuff, that what they'll do is they'll include just enough language so they can squeak out of it in case it doesn't happen. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm fed up with this nonsense. Amen? Uh, God's word's going to happen exactly the way God said it was. And when these guys, when these guys end up being wrong, they never apologize. They never come out and say, I was wrong. What was I thinking? I must be an idiot. There's no, you know, I was completely off base. I should you, you either forgive me or don't forgive me, but I'm going to get out of here because I'm not good at this. That's what they ought to do, but they don't. 
They never apologize. They try to get out of it somehow, some way, saying, well, maybe enough people prayed and God pulled back on it. It doesn't work that way. False apostles, false deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. So, um, back in Genesis 3, turn there, because this is Satan's how he works. We covered the issue of questioning God's word. Yea, hath God said. So let's question the authority and authenticity of God's word. Uh, by the way, had great meetings uh, with Pastor John Uter and his church and had several visitors come in. And praise the Lord, I didn't get into a fight with any of them. They all believed the Bible. Amen. They didn't, they didn't come in with their NIVs calling me stupid or anything like that. But anyway, uh, just some good meetings. But the first thing that Satan does is question the authenticity of God's word to get, to get you in your mind to believe that your Bible is not right in what it says. Second thing, directly contradict God's word. You shall not surely die. So he comes out saying, number one, we don't think God really said this. Number two, our, our knowledge is better than God's knowledge, and our, our word says the exact opposite of God's word. You shall not surely die. God was not telling you the truth. In other words, they're making God a liar. You shall not surely die. The objective of that, once you, once you have in your mind, you've been told that your Bible is wrong, you've been told something that is the complete opposite of what God said, so now you reject God's word and you're going to accept the replacement for it. The replacement for it is, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan then replaces God's word with a secret false gospel, a mystery doctrine that he declares God knows it, but God refuses to tell anyone what that doctrine is. And Satan then becomes the agent of illumination. That's what 2 Corinthians 11 saying. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. We know that what Satan speaks brings darkness to a person's life. Sin is dark. Sin brings darkness. Satan's words and his temptations bring darkness into our life, not light. But believe it or not, there are religions around the world, just as Israel did in the Old Testament, that actually worship the serpent as a being that brings illumination. The, the, the idea behind yoga, do not practice yoga. Don't do it. Don't, don't have anything to, well, well, it's stretching. Well, then stretch. But don't ohm yourself, okay? Don't wad yourself up and try to clear, clear your mind. Don't do that. Because the object behind uh, yoga is, there's a teaching called kundalini. That sounds like an Italian dish to me, but... Anyway, Kundalini says that at the base of your spine is a coiled up serpent. And that serpent wants to be released out from the base of your spine, your tailbone. And he wants to touch the center of your mind so that you can have enlightenment. So the idea behind Kundalini is that you meditate and chant do repetitive chants, Jesus told us not to do that, so that that beast, that serpent, can be released from where he is, coil up the 33 bones of your spinal column, touch or bite your pineal gland, so your pineal gland is activated, and now you'll have illumination. What's in the serpent's mouth? Poison. The words that he says are the poison, okay? You can have your mind poisoned by false doctrine, amen? So that's what he does. The idea behind it is to replace what God said to do with what he says. He says God knows this, but he's not gonna tell everybody, so I'm the, be, gonna be the one to tell you. It, the, there's a myth, in myth, a lot of mythology has a basis in truth, I call them the fossilized remains of what the Bible says. Because while you have Satan falling down from heaven as the illuminator of mankind, 
He's delivering man a message that God doesn't want man to have. So you have a story called Prometheus. Prometheus was a demigod that saw that all the gods in heaven had fire and man didn't know how to make fire. So Prometheus stole Zeus's fire and brought it down to earth to give mankind the ability to make his own heat and to make his own light because fire equals light. Okay, that's what these bulbs are doing. They're firing, only they're not burning oxygen because there's no oxygen to burn in there, but they're firing just the same. So fire equals light or illumination. And the idea behind Prometheus is he is the one who is cast down from heaven and comes down to earth to bring mankind illumination by giving man fire. That in itself is not the true story, the true version of it. The true version of it is Satan being cast down out of heaven and he's going to give man this illumination, okay? And so that's the lie of it. Let me give you some examples. You have the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, it says, another testament of Jesus Christ. So, Mormons say that they use a King James Bible. But they say they're the 54, tran the 54 plus translators, the King James translators used scholars and the, uh, the clergymen from all over Egypt, when they ran into a situation where they couldn't agree as to how a text was to be translated, they called upon men from all over the land to assist them in that translation process. It was a very open process. So they, here's 54 men, 54 plus men, translating the King James Bible over a period of seven years. And the Mormons say it wasn't translated right. Here's Joe Smith with golden plates with a language that nobody knows that he had to have special glasses so he could see the language and give the interpretation by himself and he translated the Book of Mormon and he did it perfectly without any mistakes in it whatsoever and from a book of, from a, from a book of golden plates written in a language that nobody's known nobody has ever seen the book of the golden plates and once that was translated, the golden plates, I don't know if they disappeared or they took, was taken back into heaven or what, but nobody's ever seen this book that he translated it from. But he got it right in the, book of, in the Mormon's eyes. Joe Smith is right, and all the King James translators are wrong. Okay? That's how nuts that stuff is. But the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants, all of these things add up as the replacement to God's Word. In other words... Where the Book of Mormon, what the Book of Mormon says in the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price, what they say always trumps the Bible. If what they're saying disagrees with the Bible, then the Bible's wrong and what they're saying is right. They have replaced God's Word. All right? Now, then we have morals and dogma, which is Freemasonry. Freemasonry, and there are men, church members, who go and join the lodge. They, number one, They've got to bow down before a man they call worshipful master. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. Amen? Cannot serve, you cannot serve a worshipful master and serve Jesus at the same time. The morals and dogma or the doctrines of, of masonry are a replacement to God's word. Even though they have a Bible on the altar there, there's a square and compass on it, which says that the teachings of Freemasonry are the true keys to understanding what's in the Bible. In other words, you've got to have this mystery doctrine in order to understand the Bible the correct way. That is not true. Then I have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism book is the replacement of the Word of God. And I'll give you an example. In the Catholic Catechism, they list the Ten Commandments, but they completely omit the Second Commandment in the Catechism. The second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Well, the catechism takes that out. It does not even admit that it's there in the Catholic catechism book. They then take the tenth command commandment, which is thou shalt not covet, and they divide it in two parts. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. That's the ninth commandment. The tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and then everything else that belongs to your neighbor. So that's how they get 10 out of it. They divide the 10th one in two, split it up, but they omit the second commandment. 
And Catholics accept this. They accept this as being the truth. And I've, re I've got a catechism book and I'm going through it. And already I'm seeing how they do it. The catechism actually says that you as the church member, you do not have the right to read and interpret the Bible by yourself. You must believe what the priest tells you about what the Bible says instead of just believing the Bible. And they actually say that fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism is dangerous and, and, to, not, and to avoid these people. Stay away from them because they're, they're part of a cult because they believe that only the Bible can be right. I found myself guilty. Amen. So what they do is, and this is what they call it, the magisterium. The magisterium is the popes, the cardinals, who decide what the Catholic Church is going to believe. And if you don't believe that, then you're going to go to hell. So the magisterium, any place where they, what they say disagrees with the Bible, obviously the Bible is wrong and what the pope said is right. It is a replacement for what God said. God said, is by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the catechism says, you're not totally saved, and cannot be totally saved, simply by grace alone. You must perform works, and functions, and say prayers, and give money, and attend masses, and do all of these things in order to be fully saved, but that only lasts as, as, as long as your next sin comes up. When your next sin comes up, you're, you're gone. You're going to go to hell and pay for that unless it's repented of and you do penance for it. So they replace the grace of God with works, salvation, and idol worshiping. So that's how they do it. Did you think of any other examples in the world that you know of where a religion or a man replaces God's word with their own? And I'm, I'm not, you know trying to trick you up or anything like that just thought you might want to participate so to just sit there like loaves of bread okay anybody 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 yes d uh, jehovah's witness absolutely what was funny was brady brady crumb always had a king he had a king james bible and he knew it and every time I'd try to think of a way to get to Brady about the deity of Christ or about hell or anything like that, I'd just wait for him to call. Because I'm going, I got him this time. And he'd call and we'd talk. And I said, Brady, I got something to run by you real quick. The Bible says, and I'd give the verse, and he'd stop and he'd get his New World Translation out. And he'd read it, and they changed it so it doesn't say what the King James says. And he said... That's, that's the New World Translation. That's the, that's the correct version of the Bible. And it, Brady, no it ain't. No it ain't. And I'd always tell him, I told both of them, you guys need to get along, get a King James Bible out and start reading and then ask God, is that not the Word of God? And in a, in a, at a different time, but in a very similar fashion, God dealt with both of those boys about how right the King James was and they finally come out of it. Okay, but you're right, the, the Jehovah's Witness completely replaces any version of the Bible. But here's the thing. The NIV, New American Standard, they are very, very close in their translation to the New World Translation. The missing verses out of the NIV are missing out of the New World Translation. A lot of the places where hell is mentioned in the King James, it's, they changed it or took it out in the NIV and the New World Translation version of the Bible, which is Jehovah's Witness Bible. So the NIV and the New World are very, very similar in what they say. You could not preach the doctrine of hell with an NIV. You could not do it because they have, and, or with a New King James Version. With a New King James Version, you cannot preach the true doctrine of hell because they've taken hell out 22 times in a New King James. Okay? That is, that is a replacement for God's word. All right. Anybody else? Think of one. Yeah. When, when, well, if, if the, I didn't know they did, but if the Lutherans accept the Apocrypha, which are the, the books uh, written between Malachi and Matthew, the Catholic Church does, 
uh, then that's a replacement for God's word. If the Apocrypha says something, but it contradicts the Bible, they still believe the Apocrypha. Anybody else? A replacement for God's word. Going once, going twice. All right, let's move on. Satan is, so number one, he, he is the dis destroyer. Ah, thank you, Kevin. Evolu he, Kevin said evolution and science. Where, and here's the thing. There are church members all over this country who say they are Christians, but they accept the theory of evolution and they accept science over what the Word of God says. According to science, life started on this planet about two billion years ago. Somehow, some way, in a pool of goo, lightning struck and a cell just popped out, just like that. One cell. And they actually believe this, that a, an active, viable, working cell with DNA and mitochondria and all of those things just started. And it had enough material in it, enough DNA to be able to copy it and make another cell so it became a two-cell organism. I don't believe that. That is stupid to think that I don't care if it's a one-sentence book of DNA. I have never, ever, ever seen random... Uh, you don't see the grass growing in letters out in the front yard. Just one day, all of a sudden, grass growing in letters where you can read something in the grass. That doesn't happen. Books, words, sentences, they don't write themselves. Amen? You cannot have a complete viable working cell just pop up just like that. Because they don't know how that happened. They just said that it did happen. So you've got to have two billion years in order for the cells to actually become us. And it's crazy to believe that. But you've got church members all over the country who say they are Christians and they say they worship God. But when it comes to believing the creation account as it's written in Genesis 1, they believe science over the Bible. Science and evolution is a replacement because they've, what they'll say is, well, that was written as an allegory. It does, it's not literal. It's not to be taken literal. Where does it say that? In the Bible. It does not say that. David said, thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So the way Moses wrote Genesis chapter 1, David said it was absolutely true the way he wrote it. Perfectly right. Amen? Appreciate that. So Satan cast doubt on God's word, destroys God's word. He hates God's word. Now let's look at Satan's job as tempter and provocateur. What is a provocateur? You ever watch Donnie Brook? on PBS Channel 9. Kind of a boring show, but I don't know if it's still on. But you would have a panel of people, some conservative, some liberal. And the man who was running the uh, discussion was called the provocateur. And what he did was he would bring up issues that were going on in local politics, state, state politics or national politics, he would bring up issues like that and just throw it out to the panel and let them start fighting one another. Every time I'd watch it, I'd see them little greasy liberals and it'd just make me mad. Man, I don't like liberals, okay? But anyway, I'd just watch it and just go, you people are stupid, you know. It wouldn't do good to get me on that. But a pro provocateur in that sense provokes these people to start barreling one another, all right? So that's what a, he provokes people. Stirs up trouble. That's who he is. First Chronicles 21. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. God told David, do not number the armies of Israel. Do not number them. Why would God tell him that? Why would God tell David to not number his armies? He would think then that he won the battles because of the number of men that he had. 
But God has shown us in the Bible through Gideon that it doesn't take 500,000 men in an army to, be, to defeat the enemy. God selected 300 men, and all they did was break their pitchers, shine the light, and say the sword of the Lord in Gideon. And the, I think it was the Moabites down there, they saw that. They thought that every one of those candles represented thousands of men who were ready to storm down on them. They didn't know that there was only those guys standing up there holding the, holding the lanterns. That's all there was. And they broke and run and, and got out of there. So God told David, David, I don't want you to number your armies because I don't want you to think that when you're winning these battles that you're doing it because you have a superior army or you have more on your side. You're only winning them because I'm allowing you to win. But Satan provoked David to number Israel. He pushed him to do it. And I'm telling you, Satan knows how to push each and every one. If David, David was a man after God's own heart. That's what, that's what God said about him. David is a man after my own heart. I love David. David is like me. And yet David could be pushed to number Israel, contradicting what God told him to do. And it worked. Do you realize Satan knows how to push you? He knows where all your buttons are. And on any given day, he's going to push those buttons because he thinks that he can control you. Now, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But when he pushes, he knows there's a pretty good chance that you're going to do what he wants you to do. And it's always going to be in disagreement with what God told you to do. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Who is the tempter here? It would be Satan. Satan is the tempter. He's the one that provokes people. He's the one that brings their attention to their sin. He does not make people sin. Who was that? Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make him do it. He did it because he wanted to do it. But the devil loves to get you to draw your attention to what you lust after, what you crave after, what you want to do. He's the one that draws you to that. Okay, so imagine a thousand year period where Satan, the tempter, is locked up. I don't believe that we're going to have a perfect world but I think it's going to be a lot better than it is now because the tempter has been locked up. All right? Uh, Matthew 4. In fact, turn to Matthew 4. Let's look at that. We have Satan himself before Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. There's another version of this in uh, Luke. I think it's Luke chapter 4. But Matthew chapter 4. And you, I've said this before, but think of, the, think of the contrast. Satan provokes Eve and tempts Eve to sin, and Eve sinned and Adam sinned. When Satan provoked Adam, it worked. He, he, he sinned in disobedience to God. When, in the New Testament, when Satan provokes Jesus, he fails. Jesus is the only one who has not sinned Satan didn't go to Mary went to Jesus you've also heard me say this Adam and Eve had everything they needed in the Garden of Eden given to them freely they were not hungry they were not in want they had no needs they didn't even need clothing the weather temperature must have been just absolutely perfect for them to just walk around as free as they were. They were totally free. They had no need whatsoever. And yet Satan, this is us. Satan, we can be, our bellies can be full. And we drive by a restaurant and go, well, that smells good. Whew. Okay. Or maybe I can do that. Okay. But I'm, I'm telling you, we can be full of sin and then want more sin. That's who we are. Jesus had been hungry. For, he had been starving for 40 days. And the first thing Satan says is, turn these stones to bread. 
and Jesus being hungry for 40 days. When you, you know, I don't know if you've ever fasted, but when you start fasting, usually you're hungry in the first 10 minutes. Doesn't take long at all. So, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, then, Jesus, uh, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He was very weak. His body, his body was, was very frail. And the body just consumes itself. It eats all the fat. And when there's no more fat, then the body starts eating the muscle tissue. It starts just, you, your body just starts feeding off itself. It starts eating whatever it can get. And so Jesus was very hungry after 40 days of not eating. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. If thou be the Son of God. He's questioning the authority of Jesus Christ. Just like he questions the authority of the Word back in Genesis 3. He's questioning the authority of Jesus Christ. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Do you remember the song, We are the world. We are the children. We are the ones that make a brighter day. So let's start giving. Remember that, Cubby? USA for Africa, 1984, 5, something like that. The, and Quincy Jones wrote the song. He wrote the lyrics and he wrote the music. And he got all these rock stars together. And they all joined together, happy. We're all holding hands, singing this song. And we're going to save the world. And the lyrics, and Willie Nelson sings this part. As God has shown us by turning stones to bread. Willie Nelson sang, God has shown us that he turned stones to bread. And it's a reference to this. He did not turn stones to bread. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. That was Satan's temptation of God. And God never did it. God, through Jesus Christ, said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay? Jesus did not turn stones to bread. He said, Satan, you don't know this, but I've been feeding on the word of God all these days. Okay? And God has kept me alive. You remember uh, Elijah? Elijah went out into a cave and said, Lord, it is enough. Now please take away my life. And the Bible says that the ravens came and fed him and he went in the strength of that one meal for 40 days. 40 days. One meal and he was still full and not hungry for 40 days. He went on the strength of that one meal. He didn't need the bread. God blessed him and God fed him. Then verse 5, Then the devil taketh him into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And sent unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Yea, hath God said. Okay? Satan says, I don't, believe, I don't believe that part. Prove it to me. And Jesus said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now you underline that in your Bible. Next time, next time the devil comes to you and says, won't you, won't you commit this sin because God will, God will have to forgive you. God will have, the, David, Dave Bradley tells me, he knows a pastor, he's an American pastor, King James only guy out there in Germany. He said he made the statement to me. He said, I believe in eternal security so much, I believe I could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. That is tempting God. It is tempting God to say that I can sin and, and commit abominations and I'm going to make God forgive me without repentance. That is tempting God. Don't do it. Amen? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again, the devil taking him up unto an exceeding high mountain. Showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So he is the tempter. He tempts us. He tempted Adam. He tempted Eve. 
They failed, we failed. Jesus is the only one that did not fail. And that's important. Can Jesus, can Jesus sin one of these sins and still be eligible to die on the cross? No, because he has a spot now. He is spotted by sin and, and does not qualify to be the sinless Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He's disqualified and the devil knows it. He knows it. So he's the tempter. But Jesus, remember this, Jesus was tempted. So Jesus then is able to help you when you are tempted because he knows how hard it is. Luke 8, 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. See that phrase? 2 Thessalonians 2, there shall come a falling away first. So I think that along with all the trials and temptations that we go through right now, I also believe that prior to our Lord's appearing in the air, there is coming a time of temptation. And I think that temptation there is really going to show who is and who isn't. Some are going to fall away. And Paul said there shall, there shall be a falling away first. And these are church people who make everybody think they're saved, make everybody think they believe God. But they believe in evolution or they, believe, they don't believe this part of the Bible, they don't believe that part of the Bible or, what, or they don't believe anything from the Bible and now they're changing Christianity the way it stands. And right now, maybe we can or cannot tell who these people are, but I'm telling you there's coming a time when God is going to allow his people to stand and everybody else is going to fall. In time of temptation, is what he said, time of temptation, fall away. Now, does that mean that if you're tempted and you fail, that you're not going to heaven? No, not necessarily, because a just man falleth seven times. But he gets back up. And you can still be justified by grace through faith. But what happens is these people, it's not just that they sinned. They, the, the Mark says it, I think Mark and Matthew, when they're, this is the parable of the seed and the sower, they both give the idea that they are offended by the word of God. They are offended at the word. They stumble at the word, and they're offended at it, and they don't believe it, and then they fall. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. That, and he's talking about husbands and wives. Defrauding not one another. In other words, be a husband and wife. That you may give your, and he said, there can be times, though, when you, I don't want to say separ separation, because that has a different meaning today, but... Maybe husband and wife need to have time of fasting and prayer for a while for a few days. Then that's fine. But then they come back and come together again that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. Incontinence means that you lose control. Okay? When a patient in a hospital or a nursing home is incontinent, they've lost control. And that needs to be tended to. And the incontinency here has to do with our, our urges. Uh, between a man and a wife is what it means. And he said, be careful. Husbands and wives, love one another. Keep one another close to yourself. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. There's not anything that has fallen on you that has not ever happened to anybody else. You're not, in fact, the worst person to ever live. You're not, in fact, the only one who's ever gone through this. I promise you there are others, many others. This is why I want a church where we're honest and open about the fact that we're not perfect. Now, I'm not saying we get up and just tell everybody our deepest, darkest, most evil sins. I don't think that's a good idea. But what I'm telling you is that it's good for a church to acknowledge that we have our failures, 
We have times where we go through things that we're not good people. And we're certainly not righteous in the sense that we've done things that are wrong. We are prone to do that. Our flesh still exists. And there's oftentimes we just can't tell ourselves no. So we'll have a little incontinency every now and then. But there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. Others have been tempted this way. Others have failed. God allowed them to fail. Why did God allow them to fail? So they recognize that their salvation still isn't coming by their own works of righteousness. It still isn't. It's still by grace and grace alone through faith. So, but God is faithful. Woo! God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but with temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, he's not saying here, I got to be careful with this. He's not saying here, well, I can't say it right, so I'm going to move on. God's, God's telling me, Shh, Mike, cut it. Okay, so I'm not going to. 1 Timothy 6, 9. Is it bell time? Where's our bell ringer? I'm not trying to get out of this, but... 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. The devil will use your money against you. Okay? He'll use your money against you. Well, I've got, I've got my 401k. I've got my retirement plan. I'm doing pretty good. And when we get in our mind that we're doing good, usually we don't depend on God. We depend on our own riches. No matter how great or small that is, you can have $5 in your pocket and say, well, I'm good to go. Okay, you don't have to be a millionaire. Trust not in uncertain riches. You know that verse? Let me give you the rest of it. For it groweth wings and fly away as an eagle. Okay? On the back of your $1 bill, there's an eagle. Is there not? On the back of the dollar bill, there is an eagle. That, that verse is right. Trust not in uncertain riches. Because it be, could, could be gone just like that. Am I right? Okay. If you've ever lost money in a stock market crash, you know that. Don't trust it. Don't fall into the temptation and the snare of the devil with your own riches. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. I like this. This is what I like. He made like unto his brethren. It's talking about Jesus. He was made like us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to succor. That word means help, aid, and assist them that are tempted. He is the, the Catholic version of Jesus says that Christ is sitting and he's angry at you filthy sinners. And it takes Mary who has a compassionate heart. You pray to her and she'll go to Jesus and say, my son, I'm your mother. You have to do what I tell you to do. Stop being angry at these people. They prayed to me and I'm coming to you with their names and their petitions and you have to do what I tell you to do. That's the Catholic version of it. That's a joke. If anything, Christ is a compassionate God because he came down here to live our life. He was hungry like we have been hungry. He was tempted like we have been tempted. He had it hard. He had a hard life and he knows all about it. And he loved you. He's not mad at you. He knows how easy it is for us to fall into temptation. And every time I go to my God, he's there being faithful to me as a high priest. Amen? Doesn't matter how powerful the temptation is, your God's more powerful than the temptation. Your, your God's grace is more abundant than the sin you committed. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you, God, for blessing it. God, the wiles of the devil are out there. Teach us, Lord, how he works, what he does to us. But Father, we thank you for the amazing grace of Jesus Christ, who as a faithful high priest knows our life knows God what we think about, knows what we dream about, knows what we lust after, knows what we hate, knows what we like. God, he knows everything about us and he loves us because he was one of us. And Father, we're thankful, God, that we have a high priest that we can go to that has mercy on us. Not a, not a Catholic priest who sits in judgment over us when we can, and people try to confess their sins and they don't. We have a faithful high priest that knows us and knows, and so there's nothing that we can hide from him. We just tell him everything. God, I did this. God, I'm awful. God, will you have mercy on me? And we thank you, God, that your word says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we love you for that. Thank you, God, for providing the way for us worthless, hell-deserving sinners. We thank you for Jesus. Help us, dear God, in our time of temptation, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Ring, 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 ring. I'm ringing the bell.